Hi everyone, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and Happy Holidays to you and your family. Uh, Jennifer Nicole Campbell here, and this is our special holiday edition of Music Musings. And today we're going to be talking about a piece that has entranced millions, that is Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. The Nutcracker Suite is based on the ballet that he wrote in very, very tight collaboration with uh, Petipa, who was a famous choreographer and dancer at the time. He also collaborated with him on the uh, ballet Sleeping Beauty, but this is probably even more popular for one reason is that it is a seasonal Christmas favorite. We often see many performances of this uh, performed all throughout the world and especially here in the United States. And it actually accounts for up to 40% in some cases of box office revenue for ballet companies, which is kind of a big deal. So we have Tchaikovsky and Petipa to thank for bringing us this wonderful music and for keeping our ballet companies going. I'm, I picked one particular piece that I think uh, stands alone as quite special out of the Nutcracker Suite, and that is the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. First of all, what is a sugar plum anyway? Well, I, I looked it up and apparently it's not a candied fruit like I thought it was. It's actually a, a layered hard candy that's very difficult to make. So it has this delicacy uh, to it. And of course, at this point in the Nutcracker Ballet, this is when uh, the characters are in this mystical foreign land with all the delicious candies and sweets. It's kind of like a uh, you know, 1800s version of uh, Willy Wonka, if you will. A little bit of background on why this particular movement uh, has attracted many, many people, mainly because it's use of a brand new instrument to the musical world, the celeste. The celeste is basically a keyboard instrument, but the hammers, instead of striking strings, they strike a kind of glockenspiel-like instrument. So you get this, uh, this glistening heavenly sound, and it does come from the French word meaning heavenly, celeste. And so the, the dance of the sugar plum fairy was sort of a celeste solo, if you will. Now when Tchaikovsky was working on this, Petipa said, I want there to be a sound that's like water droplets coming down from the heavens. So Tchaikovsky heard this particular instrument, the celeste, in 1881, uh, and he immediately contacted his publisher and was like, look, we have to get this instrument. It's going to be the best thing you've heard in your life. And so he said, don't tell anybody. But somehow a few people managed to find out about it, including the composer Ernest Chasson, and he kind of beat Tchaikovsky to the punch for his incidental music for The Tempest although he doesn't use it in quite the way Tchaikovsky does, and Tchaikovsky usually is the one that gets credit for first using the celeste in a piece of orchestral music. So let's dig in a little bit and see what makes this music so attractive to many listeners. Now I guess I'll take off my hat so I look more professional. There we go. Now everybody knows how the very beginning of the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy goes. So already it's a very intriguing thing. It's a very static rhythm, just eighth note, eighth rest, eighth note, eighth rest. But he keeps an E pedal tone, creating a little bit of uh, tension in the music, if you will. If he just had the same chords throughout, it would just be, right? It's kind of putting you to sleep a little bit. If he went just from a simple one chord to a five chord, we'd have, but he's very inventive with how he uses the chords in the right hand. Just listen to the chords by themselves. We have a minor chord, a diminished chord, another diminished chord, another diminished chord, so. And that, almost a mini melody is outlined with it. So it makes it very intriguing. Those are all played pizzicato, right? Which means plucking the string, so the violins, the cellos, and the string instruments have a very distinct uh, flavor to them. It sounds almost like tiptoe, so you can imagine the dancers dancing to this, right? And then comes our melody. Very simple, and this is the celeste. And this is the celeste's big moment. It really was a big moment in musical history as well, because until this point, there wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to this brand new instrument. It's a sort of an icy 
right? We have intervals of a sixth, and then we have repeated notes, which gives it this very tiptoe-like quality about it, right? Of course, we got half steps in here, which gives it a little bit more mystery to it, right? If you just went. Sounds a little bland, right? But that those repeating notes in combination with the diminished chords give it a mysterious quality. And all the while, the strings are still playing this pizzicato figure. And this notorious passage here, which sounds extremely sneaky, right? All it is is a little scale. 30 second notes, pretty quick notes, usually played by the bass clarinet. And once again, those half steps play an important role. He uses the same rhythm two sixteenths, eighths, sixteenth, eighth, sixteenth, eighth, sixteenth, eighth, and then four sixteenth notes again. And then he brings that figure back in the bass clarinet, which gives it this unearthly kind of tone. And after all, we're in the land of, of you know, candy and sweets and whatever, and it's a mysterious place, right? I mean, I haven't really heard of many places except maybe, uh, you know, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That's a whole place of sweets, but this is an imaginative place, right? He goes back to the tonic, which in this case is E. Back to our wonderful tiptoe theme. And now this, this little motive takes on a new character. Right, and he ties a bow around it very nicely. So we have. It's basically a sequence, right? A pattern that's repeated. So it gives it this kind of comfortable feeling to it. And he repeats that one motive, the two sixteenths, two eighths, in the right hand. And a little crescendo that gives it kind of an edge to the sound. And listen what happens in the next section. He starts to really diversify the rhythm. We have new rhythms and quite a nice variety. So here you go. section, right? For one thing, we got these big bare octaves happening, right? Which is on the dominant, on B, dominant is five steps up from the tonic, E, up to B. So we have these interruptions, interruptions on the offbeat, which makes it even more exciting. And we have these interesting wavering going up back down, so it gives it this feeling like we're going towards something, but we don't quite get there. Then we have this interruptions of these triplets, kind of delightful, cute little triplets. And repeated notes, kind of taking from those series of repeated notes. Right? And again, thinking about dancers, like for example, when dancers are on point, right? They're having to make these really small, tiny movements on their tiptoes. So it kind of reminds me of that. Perhaps Tchaikovsky worked with Petit Pot on that very thing. And again, those Bs interrupt because they're on the offbeat. If they were on the onbeat, it might sound something like this. have as much of an intriguing quality about it. When it interrupts something, it sounds much more exciting, right? And then he interrupts it even more. 
in about the third line of the sequence. He interrupts it at the end of each measure. <laughs> the top of the scale that he's been hitting at the whole time. He goes up to G but then comes back down. This time we have that and then we get interrupted. Keep going up the scale. Interruption. Finally we arrive at B major. Right? The whole time we've been E minor, but finally we arrive in B major, which is the dominant key of E minor. And then this next section is really quite interesting. We have, he writes quasi arpa, which means like a harp. That's actually my favorite moment of the piece when that happens. We have very, very quick notes here. And this is played by the celeste, which has kind of a music box sound to it. There's also a sequence of events happening here. It's going higher and higher on the keyboard. So it's like we're climbing higher and higher. We're thinking about the story of the Nutcracker Suite. You know, they're traveling through this, this mystical land, right? At this point, the characters are doing that. And so traveling higher and higher, right? And this is the dance of the sugar plum fairy. So it's, it's you know, kind of a big deal. She's showing them all these interesting new uh, sweets and candies, right? Higher. Still higher. Still higher. And he writes decrescendo, it's getting softer, which makes it even more precious somehow. And then our bass clarinet comes in again, leading us back to our main theme. Right, I'm calling it sort of the tiptoe theme. It repeats, and then by the end of the piece, we have it's a very magical ending, almost like the, the Sugar Plum Fairy is uh, vanishing away somehow, right? So the piece is really interesting. It does, let me put my hat back on here and make me feel more festive. There we go. Now I feel complete. So uh, the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy is quite an exotic piece, mainly I think because of its use of celeste. It is revolutionary in that sense. So in the end, the Nutcracker Suite is a quite festive favorite around this special time of year. And I think that Tchaikovsky brings us all together and shows us how interesting and flavorful that uh, life can be around this time of year with imaginative stories and really uh, precious moments with family and friends. So maybe uh, buy a few tickets for uh, upcoming performance of the Nutcracker and enjoy with your family and friends. Again, have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and Happy New Year.